Merry Christmas. Does that sound okay? Is that too loud? No? I'm good. All right, I'll keep going. All right, Merry Christmas, everybody. Um, today, obviously, we are celebrating the birth of Jesus, the coming of God's Son. As we said in the, the Nicene Creed, as we've sung about in so many songs, today is the day that we celebrate as a church around the world that Jesus has come, that God has sent us a child, and it's a birthday, it's a celebration, the Savior of the world is here. And we celebrate Jesus because as we look back, we know that the, the first time that he came, he came to forgive us of our sins. He came, as we discussed, to take the penalty of our sins upon himself, that we might be saved from our sins, and that we might have a right relationship with God and have eternity with God to look forward to through faith in Jesus. And all of this is well and good, but... Um, if we're honest, a lot of times around the holidays and throughout the rest of our lives, this idea of forgiveness of sins can seem incredibly kind of abstract. I mean, it changes our lives personally, but it doesn't fix a lot of the problems in our lives. And, and we can often think, well, okay, the Christian faith is, is nice as a, a way of affecting me internally and my heart. But what does it have to do with my daily life? What does it have to do with the, the family problems that I have or the sicknesses that I have? Or look around. I mean, every, every day we, 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 we praise God and we thank Him for the good things that He's done in forgiving us and giving us an opportunity to, to be with Him for eternity. And yet we, we look around the world and we see that there are nothing but conflicts globally. We've got wars going on. And, Eastern Europe and rumors of wars going on in places in the Far East and civil wars in Africa. There's conflict all over. And then we look even just in our city and the number of murders that have happened here in McKinley Park and around our neighborhoods have, have gone up drastically. There's, there's violence and war everywhere, local violence. And we look around at, at those around us and we see spiritual decay, almost the, the signs of a crumbling society where people are just doing whatever they want with, with no concern for those around them or any sort of objective morality. We see the relationships around us crumbling, families crumbling, people pursuing everything but God. And... With all of that, we also look at our own lives and know that we, we even though potentially as believers are saved, we, we struggle daily with sickness in our families, with ourselves, impatience, sin. And especially around the holidays, I, uh, I love the holidays, but I know for, for many people this is actually a time, of just kind of a reminder of the loneliness of their lives and the, the lack of structure that they have, the lack of support systems or family, or, or how those things are slipping away from them. The loneliness, and then in the end, just kind of faltering of faith. This time of year, although this is supposed to be a, a very happy time when we celebrate Jesus, we often start asking questions like, does this matter? Why am I here? What's, what's the point of this? Did, did this child who was born over 2,000 years ago really did he, did he really do what he said he was going to do? Is he really going to do it? I know this is a really downer of a Christus, Christmas message, but, but the reason it is is because this, this passage that we're reading today in Isaiah came at a really downer of a time for the people of Israel. And so I want to go through that a little bit because I don't think that, that what we experience here in Chicago or what any one of you experiences in your life on a daily basis is really much different than what the original audience of this passage would have heard. They could expect exactly this sort of thing. They were constantly, even more so than we are, struggling with societal decay, struggling with a, a declining political system, enemies that were going to come and destroy them and, and they, they needed something tangible, something, something real that they could believe in. 
And so if we go back in the book of Isaiah here, the reason I I bring all of this up is because the most famous passages that we have in Isaiah, the ones that we quote every single year about the coming of the Messiah, take place in this little section of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah from chapter 7 through chapter 9. People quote this, probably at least three or four different verses in this every single year when Jesus comes. But most of the time, we don't even think about where these verses came from or why they're here to begin with. So I'm, I'm hoping... Uh, as we go through this, that you'll have a little bit better feel for what Isaiah was saying and who he was speaking to. So Isaiah is a prophet in the Old Testament, and he lived about 700-some years before the time of Jesus, and he lived in the city of Jerusalem, which was in the kingdom of Judah, which had been split off from the rest of Israel, which was a northern kingdom, and Judah was kind of the smaller, weaker of the two kingdoms. It didn't have as good of Uh, land for agriculture. It it, it was more mountainous and hilly. Like the the northern kingdoms, when they split off from the southern kingdoms um, and separated themselves, they really had like all the resources and and more people and everything. So Judah was kind of this funny little mountain-based backwater nation that used to be the capital of the city, or it used to be the capital city, the main tribe of the people of God. And now it seems very much relegated to like the sidelines. And the king at the time is not a good guy. His name's Ahaz, and, and he doesn't care about the God of the Bible. In fact, he's, he's trying to reinvent the religion. He goes to other countries, and he brings back things here and there, ways of worshiping that were, were not allowed by the God of the Bible, but, but he was, he was uh, trying to innovate his religion. He wasn't a good guy. And at the same time, you've got Isaiah, who lives in this, surrounded by these people, And and while this is happening, that nation of Israel that had rebelled against the people of Israel has come down, and they've gotten this partner with this other nation called Syria, who both are much more powerful than the nation of Judah. And the the kings of those two nations have kind of plotted together, and they've said, hey, if, if the two of us gang up, we can go down, we can take over Judah, we can basically destroy them, wipe them out, take all of the good things that they do have, and then we'll put this guy that we know on the throne there, and he'll be like a puppet king, and we'll get them to be able to do really whatever we want them to do. And so the king Ahaz in Judah is terrified because he knows these two bigger, more powerful countries are on their way down. They're already sieging. They've probably taken over most of the land, and they're basically wrapping their armies around his city trying to destroy him. And so God sends Isaiah to speak to Ahaz. And he tells him, don't, don't be afraid of the things that these people are, af- are afraid of. Don't be afraid. These people will not destroy you. I've got you. I'm going to protect you. Your nation will survive, and, and you'll stay on the throne. So God tells Ahaz this, even though Ahaz is a pretty horrible king. And Ahaz doesn't believe. Like, he, he doesn't have faith. And so God says, hey, Ahaz, ask me any sign, any kind of miracle, and I'll do it to prove to you that I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. And Ahaz says, oh, I'm not going to test God. I won't even ask for a sign. And then God says to Ahaz, well, if you're not going to ask for a sign, then I'm just going to give you one. In fact, Isaiah says, is it too much for you to like annoy people all the time that now you're just trying to make God mad too? (laughs) And so the promise of this child is given to Ahaz as a sign. He says, Ahaz, if, if you're not going to believe me, well, then I'm going to give you a sign. A young woman is going to give birth to a child, and that child is going to grow up. And when that child gets old enough to be able to know the difference between right and wrong, these kings will be gone. They'll be dead. And that's where we get the prophecy, Emmanuel. The child's name, this nickname given to this boy, is going to be Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. It's a sign to the people of Judah that Emmanuel, God with us, is there to protect them, even though their king is a worthless wicked king who doesn't even trust God. And so we've got this famous Emmanuel prophecy, and, and it's fulfilled immediately by this little boy. And yet it's, it's also fulfilled in a more full sense by our Savior. And we can get into more detail on that, and it's fascinating. But, but as that happens, Ahaz, again, refuses to believe, and so God goes on through the rest of the chapter 8, and he says, well, I'm going, he gets in much more detail about how he's going to defeat these two nations and how Judah will survive. And yet if Judah continues to deny the Lord and refuses to submit to him, well then 
This other nation that's going to attack and destroy these two northern nations, this nation of Assyria from a long ways away, they're going to come and they're going to attack Judah, and the people who live in Ahaz's kingdom will also be defeated. And so the story ends in the end of chapter 8 with basically this judgment coming down upon the people. We find out that the people, rather than listening to God, they're turning to the words of mediums and necromancers. They want to talk to dead people. They're going anywhere and everywhere they can other than the Lord. And Isaiah ends his, his statements here in chapter 8, and he says, well, my children, the ones that the Lord has given me as signs to the people of Israel, and me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. We will endure this. We're going to pay attention to God's word even when they're going and listening to everything else and changing religions and bringing in all sorts of other pagan rituals. And so the passage ends in a pretty dark, dark place. If you read it here, I'll read it for you, but starting at the end of chapter 8, it says, those who do not, those who reject the Lord, they will, who don't listen to his word, they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry, and when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward, and they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. So God's people are in the middle of this mess of a society with wars going on all around them, and nations coming and trying to destroy them, Isaiah says, we will be faithful to the Lord. We will listen to his word, and we will be a sign to everyone around here that the Lord is faithful. And now we're coming to this passage, this one that we just read, that's written in past tense. It's really weird if you read about it because it's written in past tense because it's saying that the, the things that the Lord is promising to do in spite of what Israel is, is experiencing, in spite of what Judah is experiencing right now, is as good as done. So when we read through this, you're going to read past tense after past tense. Lord has done this. This has happened. Because God's promise, he wants his people to stand firm in faith. So when he gives them a promise, he wants them to know whatever he says is basically as good as done. This is certain. And he's promising that there will be one, a child who will come, Christ will come, and the certainty of it and the certainty of his return again is so certain that the news is past. And as we read this passage, we're going to see that Jesus came to bring hope and suffering by defeating our enemies and ruling as God's son. In this text, from 9 through 9, 1 through 7, Jesus has come to bring us hope by defeating our enemies and ruling as the son of God. So I'm going to read the first part here. We just read about the thick darkness and the horrors that are going to come upon those who reject God, and then we see this. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy, they rejoice before you as with joy in the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. God gives us hope in this passage. If you notice this, he had said darkness, gloom, depression, sadness was what was going to be on all of those who reject the Lord, those who do not want anything to do with the God of Israel. And yet, he says here, there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former times, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter times, he made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Those people who were unfaithful in that last section have nothing but gloom and darkness, but the ones who have trusted in the Lord, even in the midst of darkness, those who have stood firm in their faith, those are the ones who will have that gloom turned into rejoicing. Isaiah had stated that he was going to be faithful, and so Isaiah is looking forward to the great acts of God to save his people. And notice that the anguish and gloom are gone in verse 1. They're taken away. 
And then the land, if you look at this, it's interesting because he, he talks about the Zebulun, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And then he talks about this way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, and Galilee of the Gentiles. So these are the nation, these are the regions, there's a, a few regions listed here that are all in the far northern part of the land of Israel. So when the land of Judah comes down to or sorry, when, when the king of Assyria, which is the third nation, comes down to wipe out the first two nations that were causing all the trouble for the people of Judah, the first places that get invaded are the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali, this area around the Sea of Galilee in the north. That is the part of, of Israel's land that was always invaded first, always attacked. That's why here he calls it the Galilee of the nations or the Galilee of the Gentiles or Galilee of the pagans. It's the part of God's land that was very fertile and that all of their enemies wanted and they would come in and they would just take it out, kill the people and take the land all the time. This place was constantly under conflict and constantly being taken over. It was barely in God's people's hands. And yet he's saying when God fulfills his promises to his people, he's going to do it in this far northern region that's always being attacked, that's always barely in the control of God's people. He's saying in that area there's going to be light. So if we, you read a little further uh, back, he actually says of these people who are wicked, who are rejecting God, they will have no dawn. Like the sun will never shine on them. There won't be any light. And yet he then says here that the sun is rising, that light is shining, and that the darkness is driven away in northern Israel, in the land where the people are constantly falling to their enemies. And one, one commentator says something like this, and I thought this, this really stuck out to me. He says, the darkness and distress are real, but they are neither the only reality nor the fundamental reality. In any given situation, we can either sink into despair or rise to faith and hope. And so as Isaiah is listening to this, and as God's people are experiencing the difficulty that's around them, the gloom, the despair, the darkness is everywhere. And yet God has called his people in Isaiah to be firm in faith, knowing that one day the darkness will be taken away and the light will come and will shine. And we're also told in the book of Matthew, which we've been reading through and we've been studying for the past year, that this passage is actually initially and partially fulfilled when Jesus shows up on the scene. In Matthew chapter 4, it's, we, we've read this. I'll start in verse 12. I won't, I won't read the whole thing, but it says, Now when he, that is John, heard that Jesus had been arrested, or when, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he went to Galilee. He left Nazareth and he went to Capernaum, which is a land up here in this land of Galilee of the Gentiles, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. And, it, and Matthew tells us this, so that what was spoken by the prophet of Isaiah may be fulfilled. And then he just quotes this. These people who walked in darkness, they've had a great light shine on him. The nation is increased and multiplied. This is a fulfillment. And it says, from that time, Jesus began preaching in that area, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus coming in his first coming is the fulfillment of this passage. That the people who were constantly being overrun by their enemies, that had no hope, were the first to see the Messiah. They were the first to receive the Savior. And then on top of that, we see that not only was the nation not crushed and not destroyed and wiped out, but God had multiplied them. He'd given them children and many children. The nation had grown from like this tiny little remnant of people who would not trust God. Who, and then out of that small little group, there was an even smaller group that would trust God, and that small little group of people is now growing expansive in the land. And then if we look down at, at chapter, or verse 3, it says, you've multiplied the nation, you've increased its joy. Not only is he multiplying the number of people in the land, but he's also multiplying the amount of joy that they have, the celebration, the rejoicing, the blessing that God has brought on them. And their rejoicing is so much so that it resembles the sort of rejoicing that the people would have known from bringing in a really good harvest. So you've worked for an entire year, you've labored, you've waited for the crops to grow, and then when you do, you go and you gather in the harvest and and just like we have a Thanksgiving harvest fest here, there, back then, even more so, was this a central part of their annual celebrations. 
they were waiting for the crops to come in. They didn't have long-range shipping or refrigeration, so when the food was there, they ate and they partied like crazy. And then the other image that he gives is that they were dividing, or they were rejoicing and happy like people who divide a spoil. So if you know anything about ancient wars, when people would battle with one another, one nation or army would come in and attack the other, and then the spoils would be whatever was left over when the fighting was done. So the people who won the battle would then go and collect all of the goods from the other people they had just defeated and bring it home almost as their payment for war. And so this vision of people celebrating is the vision of someone who has just won a great victory and is able to grab all of the spoil and drag it home and bring it back to their family almost as the pay for the horrible conflict that they had to endure. And this is the sort of rejoicing that God's people will experience. A giant joy of harvest, natural blessing from God, and a major political historical blessing of God, the defeat of their enemies, and all of the blessing that comes from that. And then he says, this is all happening. It's almost too good to be true. People are unable to believe it. And so if you notice in our passage from here on, we have a bunch of words. In English, it says four, starting at verse four, and then in five, four, and then starting at verse six, four, because the audience wants to know, how is this going to happen? Like, why is God doing this? Why are we rejoicing? How does this work? God gives his people hope, this opportunity, this light shining, great celebration, multiplying nation. But how is this going to happen? Well, in verse 4 and 5, he tells us. He says, because their enemies are defeated. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every brute, or boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. So why are the people rejoicing? They are rejoicing because God has defeated their enemies. Notice this, this idea of a yoke is when one nation would capture and uh, basically rule over another nation, they would exact taxes and make them give all sorts of good stuff, like basically extorting goods from another nation. And then they would make them supply troops to go fight in battles. And they, they compared that to the yoke that you would put on the back of like an animal or a person if they were having to plow a field. So this yoke was the struggle, the work that these nations have to do for their oppressors. They'd have to pay taxes, they'd have to labor, suffer, and this was really oppression that was endured by them, that was put on them by their enemies. And then he talks here, if you read again, he says the staff for the shoulder and the rod of the oppressor. These are two tools, rods and staffs used to beat slaves, to beat workers, to force them to keep working and to work harder. This is a form of oppression that is, is inflicted. They've been defeated. Their na the nations around them are forcing them to work. And all of this suffering is going to be gone. Why? Because those things are broken. He says, as the day of Midian. And the day of Midian is interesting because he's referring here and in another place in Isaiah all the way back to a time when God's people were under a similar horrible oppression from an, a nation called Midian during the time of the judges. And God had to miraculously save his people through a judge named Gideon. And so when the people were, were suffering from this, this oppression, the, the armies of the enemies would come in and they'd set up camp and God basically told his people to do the weirdest sort of battle tactic ever and just create confusion so that the enemy would actually fight themselves, destroy themselves, and then run away, and God's people would chase them out of the land. And I, Isaiah is saying that a same sort of absolutely unexpected battle victory is going to happen. Something really unexpected. No one really expected the defeat of Midian to go down the way it did during the time of Gideon, the judge. And here, a similar great victory is going to happen in a very unexpected way. And again, I think this applies to us in a number of ways, but 
we, we look at the world around us, we look at our own lives, even our own spiritual struggles, our family struggles, health struggles, and we know that the Lord has the ability to deliver us. When Jesus came the first time, he offered salvation so that the enemies that we experience oppression from, whether they're spiritual, demonic, those that control our lives, the sin that holds us down, it's been defeated by Jesus. He's able to defeat that now in our lives. But on top of that, when Jesus comes again, all of that will be fully defeated. So that there's no more suffering, crying, temptation, struggle. That's what we look forward to. And as, as Isaiah told Ahaz, we have to endure and stand firm in faith, knowing that that's what's coming. So how is this all going to be defeated? That's the same question. How is this going to happen? Where is this amazing victory that was unexpected, like the victory of Midian, going to come from? Well, he gives us another four, starting in verse 6. He says that those enemies who came in and marched in and stomped in and caused earthquakes, their, their resources will be burned like fuel for the fire. The armies that come in, that have boots on that the people couldn't afford, that have separate sets of clothes because they can fight their enemies, get blood all over it, and then change them, those people will be defeated and their clothes will be used and burned up in fire because there will be no more fighting. There will be no more battle anymore. And that's all done because in verse 6, we are told, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So how is this going to happen? How are all the enemies going to be defeated? Well, we're going to get a gift. The gift, a present, will be a child, a son, and we've seen this before. He's promised this sign of Emmanuel that, that shows that God is with them. And then we find out here, I'll, I'll go back and read this again, that Isaiah, when he was told by God uh, what to do and to, to promise the son, he then goes and his wife, the prophetess, um, I guess he gets her pregnant in verse 3. It says, and I went to the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said to me, call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz, for before the boy knows how to cry, my father and my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. So I asked my wife if we had a son, if we could name him Maher Shalal Hashbaz. She was not as excited about that prospect as I was. Uh, it's an interesting name, but if any of you are looking for baby names, um, it's a good one. It has really good meaning. I won't get into the, to the meaning now, but it has to do with God's deliverance of his people. But we're told already that a child had been born, that a child was given as an example of what God was going to do in this current situation. But Isaiah continues the promise, this promise, because he'd said prior to this that there was going to be a child an Emmanuel child, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, was a, was a fulfillment of God's promise. He was a sign that God was with them, but now he's saying there's going to be an even better child given. Given, not, not, not born in the normal way that Isaiah had with his wife, but a special child given, born 
a son as a gift to his people. And then this child, unlike the child that Isaiah gave birth to, this child is going to have the government upon his shoulders. He's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When God keeps his promises, he does it through giving children. Children are a blessing from the Lord, but this child is an even bigger, better blessing from the Lord. It points forward to what we see in Matthew chapter 1, where Matthew tells us that all of this took place, that this virgin gave birth and that the the baby Jesus was given to Mary and Joseph. It says, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then the names given to this child show that this Jesus who was born, who fulfilled it, really was something different than any other child that's ever been born. He really was God with us. And what the Bible tells us is that Jesus currently does rule on the throne of David. We see this in the New Testament. Jesus is constantly told, or we're told that he is ruling, that he is reigning right now, that his kingdom is advancing throughout the world right now. So in the Bible's story, Jesus came as this child to this virgin who was born, and he was a perfect and sinless child because he was born in a special manner to a virgin so that he did not have our sin nature And then as he grew, he lived this perfect life for us on behalf of us as the representative of God or or to God for us so that he could live a perfect life. And then he died on our behalf to take the punishment for our sins. And then he rose again from the dead as a sign that he was the perfect sacrifice for sins, that he was acceptable to God. If he was just a normal guy, born from a normal woman, like Maher Shalal Hashbaz was here, when he died, he'd stay in the grave. But Jesus was different. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He died a substitutionary death to pay the penalty for our sins. And then he rose again as the sign that he really was the one that we've been reading about here, the one promised by God. And the Bible tells us that when when Jesus told us at the end of Matthew, we'll get there eventually, to go and make disciples of all nations, he's calling us to disciple all nations, basically to ask all nations to declare to all nations through the world that Jesus is king and all nations need to be submitted to him. And so as we as a church make disciples here and as we send missionaries elsewhere, the goal is to see Jesus rule and reign spread throughout the entire world so that everybody knows him as the king, the one who has the government of the world on his shoulders. And he's advancing his gospel peacefully right now as a prince of peace, spreading his gospel through the world, freely offering salvation to anyone who will receive it. That's the gospel that we believe, that Jesus has come in the flesh and he's peacefully, lovingly offering people to become citizens of heaven above, like we sang in our previous song. This is, this is the amazing gospel, that Jesus is king, he is the ruler of the world, and yet he offers anyone who will believe a chance to enter peacefully into his kingdom and to be his people if they will just repent of their sins and believe in him and obey him. And we're told here that he has four or five names. So we're not really, I'm not sure. I'm going to go with it could be either. But people debate whether or not we have four names here for Jesus in verse 6 or five names here for Jesus. He's either wonderful as a standalone word or the wonderful counselor, mighty God, Everlasting Father, or Prince of Peace. And the word wonderful, if, if you understand it, it's the closest thing that they had in the Bible to something like supernatural, like kind of God-like, but like just beyond anything we can understand. That's what Jesus is. Because he is the eternal God-man, he's unlike anything we've ever seen. He's out of this world. Jesus didn't come from the world. He came down and was incarnate. He is God become man. 
And so because of that, he is wonderful. And, and if you combine that with this idea that he is a counselor, what a counselor is is really just like a, a strategist, someone who understands how things work and is able to make decisions and is able to decide on things. So in their time, kings would have counselors, and as they were trying to make decisions about how to govern their kingdoms or what to do geopolitically, they would rely on smart people to give them advice. And Jesus is that. He's the God counselor. He's the, the amazing, wonderful person, the one who above all else knows what needs to be done. He's the master strategist, all-knowing, all-wise, supernatural God. That's Jesus, the wonderful counselor. And then we're told that he is the mighty God. And this, is a, this, this idea is like of like the divine warrior, the, the God strong man, the one who's powerful, who can defeat all of his enemies. If we had to attach like a, a, a theological term, we would say omnipotent, or he's all-powerful. This child who was born is infinitely powerful, can defeat all of his enemies, can defeat every enemy. He is great. He is mighty God. God himself, the strength of God. And we're told also that he is the everlasting father. He is, here the, the word father isn't to say so much that Jesus is like confused with God the father or really like a father of anybody, but the, the idea of a, a father back then was that any king would have been considered like the father of a nation. So essentially what this is telling us is that Jesus is an eternal ruler, a forever king over a forever kingdom who is the head over all things. We're told in the New Testament that Jesus was made the head of all things, over the church, over all kingdoms of the world. The government of all the universe is on his throne, or is, is, is on his shoulder as he sits on his throne. He is the eternal, everlasting Father. And then we're also told that he's the Prince of Peace, this idea of prince, again, isn't something like we think of where you've got a king and then you've got a prince underneath him. The, the term for prince was the term that they would use for like an official, like an administrator within a kingdom, someone who would make rules and decide. And Jesus is this perfect administrator to such an extent that he brings about peace. And again, peace isn't just the word that we understand that peace to be. So in, when we think about peace, we think about lack of conflict, no war, um, people getting along. And, and that's true, but when the Bible uses the word peace, it also has with it this idea of kind of this holistic goodness going on, blessing, like a strong economy, like prosperity. Jesus is the kind of administrator that brings about peace, lack of conflict, but then he's able to govern in such a way that health, wealth, joy, prosperity grow and get bigger and better. He's the perfect administrator the Prince of Peace. He brings about joy and blessing. All of these things, as, as we've been, been looking at them through Advent, they seem too good to be true. And that's why we're called to have faith. That's why, I'll, I'll read it to you again. I've alluded to this but so many times. But here in Isaiah Isaiah tells Ahaz, he says, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. When he's telling him, in the midst of the suffering that you think you're going to experience, with all of the raging wars around you, with all of the chaos in the world, people that want to remove you from your throne and put somebody else in your place, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. And here we have the wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, who has come, lived for us, died, rose again, and ascended to the right hand of the Father where he rules, and he's promised us he's coming back. It's as good as done. We can trust him. And then verse 7 says, And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. As I was studying this passage, I, I read this, uh, 
verse and the whole passage in, in a variety of translations, and I just want to read a few of them to you because this is so powerful. I could expound on this and talk about an increasing government, infinite government that goes and grows and grows forever, spanning galaxies and universes and all times and space. But it's just as easy to read somebody else's translation. So here, in the New Living Translation, it says, His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. The Christian Standard Bible says, the dominion will be vast. Its prosperity will never end. He will, roam, he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. And then the New English translation says, His dominion will be vast and He will bring immeasurable prosperity. He will rule on David's throne and over David's kingdom, establishing it and strengthening it by promoting justice and fairness from this time forward and forever. The Lord's intense devotion to His people will accomplish this. God's already done this. He did the hard part. He sent his son to die. God humbled himself as a human, as a baby, and died. An infinite, almighty God coming back to fix everything else, that's, that's, that's the easy part on his side. And he's being patient with us, we are told, so that more people can Freely join his kingdom. So I do ask you, if, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, if you have not submitted him as the Prince of Peace, as the one who offers peace and prosperity freely, if you haven't received that today, I ask you to consider it. He came in peace. He came as a baby. He came as a child so that he could offer you salvation. But when he comes again, he's not coming in peace. When he comes again, it will be to judge those who have rejected him and those who are oppressing those around them, those who are sinning, those who are looking for alternatives to his word. When he comes again, it, it won't be in peace. So this is your chance now to turn to him, to submit to him, to repent of your sins and believe what he's done for you. But if you have done that, then I guess the best thing I can say is Merry Christmas. <laughs> Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We celebrate him. We love him. We give thanks to him today. We encourage one another, as long as it's called today, to worship and serve him. He's defeated our worst enemies. We don't have to worry about punishment for sin. We don't have to worry about... Like, like this life, the things that we go in or go through here in this life are really the worst that we're ever going to experience. And the hope that we have on the other side of this life and the hope that we have when Jesus returns for his people is immeasurable, immense prosperity, beautifully peaceful, vast dominion a reign that is just and righteous. And God's passion, his love, his firm emotional commitment is going to make sure that this all happens. Satan doesn't have any, any power over us anymore. Christ is advancing his kingdom peacefully now throughout the world. And if anything, of any kind of application that I can give for the passage today, I would say one is rejoice, celebrate that God is doing this we have hope, we have things to look forward to, we can stand firm in faith. And on the other side of it, trust in Jesus. Don't, don't worry day in and day out. There's another passage just before this where he says, like, don't, don't call a conspiracy everything that these people call a conspiracy. Don't worry, don't be terrified, don't constantly be afraid. Trust God, be hopeful. Don't turn to other things like your own individuals, your own individual abilities or 
maybe politicians, and media, uh, mediums, necromancers, spiritists. Don't turn to other things. Turn to God's Word. That is our source of hope. He is coming, and He calls us to endure and to make disciples and facilitate and be involved in advancing His kingdom throughout the world. So even in the midst of our suffering today, even in the, the gloom that we can sometimes experience in the holidays, we remember that Jesus came to bring peace to you and to me, peace with God, and he came to do it by defeating our enemies and ruling over us justly as God's son. We have a lot to celebrate and look forward to in the coming year, so praise God. Merry Christmas. Please pray with me. Father, I thank you that even this year as we look at your word and we look at the world around us, we can stand firm in faith, trusting your word, trusting your son, and the great hope that we have in him. Lord, he is our wonderful counselor and our mighty God, our everlasting father, the prince of peace that we can trust. Father, I pray that you would give us faith, that you would give us joy this Christmas, that we would be able to worship you and love one another and serve one another with a sense of hope and joy and peace because of Christ. Father, I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.